So what I'm going to uh, just cover today is um, my title is going to span from uh, TV broadcasting, which most people, at least over the age of about 40, will have probably quite bad memories of uh, dreadful black and white television lectures and things like that, um, and how they were used uh, to actually reach uh, uh, the population in, an, in a time when TV was like the internet is today. It was the way to deliver things into people's home um, from experts uh, cheaply. So it was used by the Open University from when it got its charter in 1969 as a way to deliver its teaching. Um, but that changed, and I'm going to explain how that's changed into a different remit, which is what's called lifelong learning and how more people looking around, more people will be familiar with the, the newer style OU programs um, like uh, a Frozen Planet and The Hunt and things like that, which are much more engaging and to do with lifelong learning. I'm going to switch tack slightly and talk about how uh, the OU has been developed as using its distance learning techniques to develop science skills. So this is skills for people um, most of OU students come to the OU because they missed out on, on uh, a degree level education to start with. They may well be upgrading their skills and they're often employed with very good hands on laboratory skills but want to ups up um, higher sort of level of skills, more up to date skills. And I'm going to take you right to the point of which the OU is about to roll out a whole new series of ways in which we can teach students, which is to actually develop remote operable instru um, instruments that I'm going to hopefully, if, the wi if Wi-Fi will cooperate, take you through actually running an instrument on campus down in Milton Keynes, uh, which will be uh, an interesting first. Uh, what's interesting is when Harold Wilson and Jenny Lee originally um, discussed uh, founding the Open, Open University, Harold Wilson's what, idea was it was the University of the Airwaves. And they then approached the, the then director of uh, or controller of BBC Two and said, we want to put um, footy old men in suits, um, talking to camera, describing everything from physics to, to maths and all this complex stuff. And the, the controller of BBC Two at the time was a gentleman by the name of David Attenborough. And he thought, I'm not having any of this. Um, let's put it on after the TV's finished, because um, that way they can get out of bed so OU students in the 70s and 80s had to get out of bed very early or stay up very late in order to see things. And they were usually uh, uh, heralded by this, what we call handover for, for BBC Two, and I'm hoping this works. I apologize, the sound quality is absolutely dreadful because there aren't many copies of this in existence. Okay, so this, you can't hear the sound. It's not, it's not coming out for some reason. Um, what you'd recognise is a very characteristic OU sound, which is ba 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 ba, as it, as it handed over to the OU. Now, the OU got this reputation for effectively being uh, where you saw lots of uh, people, often in black and white, and fashion in those days changed a lot quicker than OU TV programmes did. Um, this is a, a fairly good example. It would be a, somebody stood in front of a, of a blackboard presenting, to all intents and purposes, an old fashioned university lecture. To, to a camera. But they weren't delivered live. They were actually recorded, and so they were very heavily edited and, and, and uh, seemed uh, fairly seamless. But of course, because they were recorded, they were rebroadcast. And in fact, they were broadcast over and over and over and over again. OU courses would often last uh, uh, five uh, to eight years. So what you were seeing were clips of people uh, who were filmed from the fashions of bygone era. So hence, hence the, the, the idea of the, of the OU being very much uh, kippetized and uh, always in black and white. The reason why TV worked very well was actually because some of the items you just can't explain in written textbooks. So OU students are often at the end of uh, a, the, the postal chain. They receive books. They receive... I think it's plugged in. Um, they, they receive books. And actually what the TV was doing was often showing something... Um, ooh, I don't think that should happen. Uh, what did he just do to my computer? <laughs> press OK. Press OK. Right, press that OK. Sorry about this. And press that OK. OK. Hold back on. So... Am I not onto my slides? I'll let you come and do it. 
Um, so th th often the TV programs were very much TV programs, rather like we saw Peter demonstrating earlier. These were things that brought students in. They were engaging with students. Uh, so this is, just, this is just a little clip of, of actually a, ch a chemistry example, what happens when you add um, alkaline metals to water. And if you remember your chemistry, what happens is as you go up the periodic table, things get more and more interesting. So this is simply out dropping a little bit of metal onto some water. And as we go up the periodic table, and it'll get more and more, the, and the, the commentary that runs alongside it basically says it gets more and more terrifying. And hopefully you'll see at the end of the day. So this was actually done live in Milton Keynes. It was actually re-recorded and re-broadcast. I'm just going to let it run. What you'll see is as uh, we go at the periodic table, things become much more interesting. Now, this type of stuff doesn't come across in textbooks. You have to see it to believe it. And by the time you get to the very last one, um, which will run in just a moment, you can see it's getting more and more exciting. Uh, the, very, the very last one uh, is quite spectacular. Uh, this, is when you, this is what happens when you add cesium to water. So thankfully, Peter's microwave didn't do something similar. So actually, a lot of the TV broadcasts actually switched over to be much more engaging in terms of demonstrating scientific principles, very much like we saw this morning in the kitchen, because actually what they do is bring people in. But uh, the world moves on. TV got videos. We had video players, and then things moved on to DVDs. And by about 2006, so anybody who thinks they remember watching an OU-style TV lecture kind of dates you because um, in 2006 they finished. Um, no lectures have been broadcast uh, since then. And the OU switched its broadcasting strategy. Because we could put lectures onto uh, DVDs, we could show video clips on DVDs and videos, that became our, our prime way of delivering the video material. And so the OU um, renegotiated. In about 2006, the BBC wanted its nighttime telly back. And so the OU struck a deal, and basically the deal was um, they could start to broadcast overnight, but the OU kept some time to broadcast. And what the OU replaced the lectures with were series which were out there to do with engaging people, bringing people into science. So they started with formats which became quite established programmes like Coast, which now runs as its own TV series. Uh, Rough Science was a whole bunch of OU academics sent off to various places, including islands in the Pacific, the Lucky Devils to do hands-on experiments. Um, bang goes to theory ran until uh, very recently. Those programs would actually work with academics like myself. We look at the script and we develop various sort of things that went alongside them. You may well be familiar with things like stargazing, which still runs today. And um, we see uh, other things like the Big C was broadcast quite recently. And also we work with other partners, including people like Channel 4. So this was part of a switch in 2006 to this uh, lifelong learning. And about the OU produces about 25 co-productions, of which about 5 to 10 are in the area of science. And they're there to, part of the Open University's charter is public education. So part of that uh, charter requires us to actually engage with groups of, of students. And we get about uh, up to 300 million views of OU TV programmes um, every year. And these days in digital media and worldwide broadcasting, they go out all around the world. So you do occasionally find yourself travelling somewhere and you catch yourself in some interview you did years ago on, on a TV screen in, in Australia or something like that. At the same time, the OU developed um, what, what we call outreach materials. So all of the TV uh, programmes, particularly in science, develop different ways of, of engaging students. You watch the TV programme, at the end of the programme, there'd be a little snippet that said, if you found this interesting, would you like to receive a nice wall poster? For example, uh, one that went out with uh, the BAFTA award-winning uh, Frozen Planet series. Um, or, uh, it, in fact, one of the programmes I did called The Gene Code, you could actually get a set of human genome fridge magnets, uh, one of the only fridge magnet sets the university's ever produced. Um, um, great, in vast demand, we only produced a 1,000, so if you've got one, keep them in the bottom drawer, they'll be worth a fortune in the future. And, of course, uh, things like uh, posters uh, for The Hunt, which was, uh, again, a fairly recent series that ran, ran last year. These were all um, promoting and educate, designed to educate the public, but the, the idea was they were bringing, bringing people in to learn more uh, in, in uh, other OU resources. 
So the other thing uh, that the OU also did was it produced a series of um, interactives, fun interactives. Some of these were just, just to have a bit of fun, and I thought this was actually quite interesting. This was, uh, these were produced in association with the Tunda anniversary of Darwin for a whole series of programmes that went out on the BBC. And it was just a, a little gimmick which was talking about human evolution where you could upload a photo of yourself and turn yourself into some uh, prehistoric uh, uh, form of man. And I think if I run this one, uh, these are two characters you should be reasonably familiar with from, from news at the time. And it was just a little bit of fun. Um, th these are thankfully uh, Boris Johnson donated his uh, Twitter photo. Uh, and I didn't deliberately choose him as uh, 3.6 million years old. Australia Pitnick, as I think he is. Um, so any guesses who the second one is? The second one looks remarkably lifelike, actually, when you know who it is. So this was just a little game. I'll stop it halfway and see if you can guess, actually, because it kind of... Uh, I reckon it starts to look about there. It is, of course, David Cameron. <laughs> so they were fun. They were meant to... It's surprising what people learn when they're playing these types of interactive games. So th this is the type of thing that, that they give OU academics to do, and we have a lot of fun doing it. Um, but there's a serious other side as well, which was part of that charter requirement for lifelong learning means that actually about 5% of all OU courses are offered completely free of charge through a resource called OpenLearn. And we have about 4 million learners a year will go in and do various bits of the material. It's just self-study. You can go in and learn about all sorts of things, not just science, right the way across all of the university outputs. But alongside that, the world has gone digital, so the OU has an, over a million subscribers on iTunes University. Um, oh, looks like uh, you've just tweeted, Kelly. <laughs> um, and also, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel. So actually, a lot of the old OU TV programs, if you really want to go watch them, you can go back and watch them uh, uh, on YouTube. But there's other platforms coming along. Um, the Open University has invested its technology in terms of developing educational development into a platform called FutureLearn, uh, in which uh, the most recent version of free learning called Massive Open Online Courses, or MOOCs for short, um, is going out. And this is um, some Open University uh, courses are on here. These are normally courses of between 8 and 10 hours. Um, uh, I know, for example, uh, Genomics England and Health Education um, have produced uh, two or three now in uh, collaboration with various people around the country on genomic medicine, for example. And uh, these are all available free. They use a, a, a platform which what they call social learning. So, for example, this may be that you're, you're learning how to do genomic sequencing and the number of people studying alongside you, there will be people out there who are actually experts on genome sequencing. And if you pose a question, you get the answer back from the people who really know their stuff. It's not unusual as an OU academic to be teaching students who are doing uh, world-leading research, um, often supporting at a technical level projects. So uh, I, I teach a molecular biology course, and one of those aspects is, is sequencing technology. And last year, I had one of my students come on and actually tell me what I got wrong, because he was actually a technician running one of the sequencing facilities in the Sanger Center. So it's, it's actually great to have that. So, so MOOCs are the latest thing. And um, as from this year, um, all that Open University um, um, OER materials uh, will actually be available on Google Play and Amazon, Amazon Kindle, all for free. So in terms of transition from broadcasting to providing materials out there for general lifelong learning, that, that's where the Open University is. But actually, teaching science is also about teaching practical skills. It's about te uh, taking students and teaching them, as we saw this morning, doing stuff and watching practical science is actually quite, quite interesting. So there's TV experiments that were done. And you can tell this is old because it's, it's in black and white. This is actually um, a guy called Eric Stannard that's actually calculating the value of G by rolling a rubber ball down a little, a little wooden implant, uh, incline. Um, TV experiments, the OU also used to mail out um, kits. So you used to actually receive a box. It was about this big as a level one student. And in it was all your practical work for the year. Um, it included microscopes. It included chemistry sets. It included all sorts of bits of, bits of kit. And the campus in Milton Keynes used to actually process about 7,000 sheep brains a year. 
and actually send those out in the kit. So if you were a student in the 1970s and you still got a sheep's brain, I'd quite like to hear from you because I suspect it's probably turned to mush by now. So sending out this stuff was the way we got our students to engage with practical work, to actually get their hands dirty, as it were, and see what doing science was really all about. That kind of mo has moved on. We don't mail out kits anymore. Um, the OU was so big, we had our own post office, so that's all now gone. The TV studios have gone, and they're all now being replaced by the next generation, which is a series of instrumentation I'm going to tell you about. So with digital, with more people getting computers, we turn much more to interactive screen types of experiments. And the OUs move now completely away from the hands-on home types of experiments. And for today, you still need the basic experimental skills. But actually, an awful lot of science today is actually done digitally. You only have to walk around outside to realize that whilst you do look down a microscope, most microscopes are controlled with software, you're capturing images, you're sharing images. So actually the instrumentation is all done through digital interfaces. And that's a really important skill for, for scientists to, to learn. Communication is also digital. We exchange information through forums, through Twitter, through, through Skype. So actually digital communication is huge. A lot of science is also, oh, there we go, Science Council have just tweeted as well. I should have switched that off. Um, a, lo a lot of stuff is also done remotely, um, by which I mean, a lot of the, because of the financial costs, um, you only have to look at something like the Large Hadron Collider in terms of its budget. Um, most of that science, whilst it's done at the Large Hadron Collider, gets distributed around the world in terms of the analytics. So it requires um, people to share information, and it requires that information flow backwards and forwards. It includes also being able to control and manipulate uh, variables. The ultimate distance, of course, is sending things into space, the OU is very uh, famous for, uh, uh, for not landing or landing on Mars very badly, but also put in the Philae lander, which was effectively a very small GCMS instrument onto a comet. So actually communicating with these types of instruments, receiving the data back and, and, and actually analysing the meaning of that is something the OU has been developing quite a lot. So in space is important. I'm going to talk about the technology that's arisen from that and the expertise. And the last thing is a lot of science these days is both multidisciplinary. We have multidisciplinary teams across lots of areas of science, particularly in health, and also interdisciplinary. And what that means is communication is important. Explaining what you are doing to people who need to know the significance of certain aspects of that work so they can then take it on is actually a very important skill in for today's scientists. So um, about five, four or five years ago, the Open University launched what's called the Open Science Laboratory, into which we've now put all of our online teaching uh, instruments and, and uh, ways in which we teach things. Um, this is just a flag of the fact that it um, had a nice educational award. And they range from simple interactives. So most people will have seen the, and played around with computer interactions of various things. I'm, I'm going to get this running. Um, but, but what a lot of the OU resources are, this is just a little video clip of me showing. It's a very simple uh, chemistry experiment. Um, what it allows a student to do is completely play. You can, pick up, you can pick up samples, you can turn the Bunsen burner on, you can make the Bunsen burner um, go yellow or go blue. And in this case, you're putting different salts in, and it's, it's an elemental flame test. Whereas you can identify the salts by the color of the flame. So for example, when you put lithium in, you get a nice red flame, and those types of things. So you could, do this, you could do this in a lab, but actually you can do it um, uh, without being in a lab. And a student can sit there and they can spend five minutes doing this, or they can actually spend 20 minutes. In this case, there's also a, spe a spectroscopy analysis that, that boots up as well, just to make it slightly more interesting. So that's a fairly simple interactive tool that allows a student to learn at their own pace. Uh, they, can, they can work their way through it, and of course there are samples in there with just labelled one and two that then, then become the question, well, based upon what you've learned, what's number one and what's number two? So that's a fairly si simple type of interaction. Um, we also include things which are slightly more complicated. Uh, this, for example, is, an, uh, is a, uh, if I get it running, it is, is an experiment that actually students carry out over eight days, and this is a, a slightly edited video clip. 
Um, getting students to interact with real experimental animals is very difficult. So this is a way of asking students what they have to do. So they're given eight rats. It's a bit like a Tamagotchi type experiment. They're given eight rats and they have to feed those rats for eight days. They have to record their data. They have to make accurate records and things like that. And depending on what they feed them, they've learned all the background about uh, giving rats slightly less food to encourage them to engage in behavioral experiments. But they, they go through a whole series of, of experiments where they're trying to look at how uh, sustained attention works in a rat. And you, you, you can't really see this very much, but actually that's actually a, a real image of a rat in a behavioral chamber. And what you'll see is um, that there'll be a flash and the rat will actually respond to it. It's a, it's a respond to light. It's the equivalent of looking at sustained attention in, in, in humans. So this is a way of asking students to, to engage and carry out practical work. They also often think, have things like embedded animations. So these types of uh, ways of getting students to work at their own pace, wherever they are uh, in the world, allow, allow the students to actually engage with materials. And this, for example, is just a, 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 um, the data test. I'm, I'm going to skip over the rest of that. So what we can now do is actually put these together into uh, courses. So in, in this particular case, what I've shown you is just uh, the home page for the Open Science Lab for a particular module that my students are currently coming to the end of their studies in. And what they will do is spend um, about 300 hours in the year and actually work their way through a whole series of different investigations. Those investigations will force them into working together they'll be forced into communicating with each other because that's some of the key skills. So they'll be collecting data from a range of analytical instruments and also developing their skills uh, of um, analytical skills. A lot of the instruments we have are not just simulations, they're actually built upon uh, proper underlying data. So for example, we take samples like, for example, they do a DNA quantitation assay using a spectrophotometer. We actually take entire spectrum program the instrument so actually the instrument the student can go in and collect data that is wrong they making the experimental choices and like any instrument if you make the wrong choices and you don't do the appropriate controls and you don't take replicate readings you don't get the right answer so they're actually designed to be uh, robust with good underlying online data and they allow a student to explore importantly they allow a student to explore at their own pace so some students will be very familiar with this type of technology, it will breeze all the way through. We put them together into much more structured investigations. So, so a student will, will do about 300 hours of study in this, and then they'll finish off by carrying out a small team investigation where they actually have to work in a team and produce a, a data report at the end of it. So if you go to the Open Science Lab, and I'll put the website up later, and I've got some leaflets if you're interesting. We currently have about 120 of these types of activities. I'm just showing you these because these are in sort of my area. 48 of them are completely open. They include things like digital microscopes, and these digital microscopes are where we have scanned entire slides at all the magnifications. So what you can do is completely explore slides. So there are slide sets in there for teaching A-level uh, plant biology and A-level animal biology. There's a whole set of histopathology slides in there, for example. These are all free and open resources as part of our, um, our, our outreach. So you can, you can go and have a look and see, see what you can um, find that you'd be interested in. Finally, I'm going to touch on where we're currently at in terms of we can show videos, we can get students to actually engage with very deep simulations of data, but actually what we'd really like is, is to try and develop really accessible instruments. So um, the university was funded uh, by um, Hefke recently to develop what's called remote instruments, remote, remote accessible instrumentation. So this is on the back of the OU doing a lot of work on uh, communication, uh, things like satellite communication, communicating with instruments. And it's to develop a whole series of instruments. And th th these are the ones that are, are being done first. Um, these are all uh, different analytical systems that most people will be familiar with. And they're all being developed as remote tools, by, by which I'll give you a demonstration in a minute. What this means is that students will actually be trained in how to use these instruments um, over different periods of time and then we'll go in and actually collect data. So we already have a project, for example, where students can, they spend about 20 hours being taken through how to use an optical 
um, telescope that sits in Mallorca, and then they're given a six-hour period where they can choose to point it wherever they want, collect whatever data they want, and, and uh, whatever, as part of their studies. And, and the same principle uh, will apply to these instruments. This is an example of a very boring picture of a, of a scanning EM. This little box in the, in, the, in the corner is about the size of a, an old-fashioned PC tower. It's a scanning EM. It's one that's mostly used for materials, but is actually great for looking at uh, large uh, things like uh, biosamples. This is actually an eye of, uh, of Drosophila that our Level 3 students will be looking at. This is, actually comes from one of my PhD students' projects. My uh, research is in DNA damage and DNA repair, and we use Drosophila as a way of tracking DNA damage, uh, and we count cells in the eye. So actually, we'll be allowing students to go in and collect real data uh, using things like uh, scanning EMs. So this is where it gets slightly scary. And I'm actually going to give you a, 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 I'm actually going to try and demonstrate um, uh, one of the instruments uh, live. Uh, I've got three lined up, and hopefully one of them will work. Um, we've got um, uh, an experiment. So these are all sat in various places. I'll, obviously, I, I'm not going to show you the, the uh, Mallorca because it's light, and therefore you wouldn't see anything. Um, we have a qPCR machine that sits in my lab in Milton Keynes. Uh, we have uh, this X-ray scattering instrument. I'm going to do a Bragg experiment with and that sits in Milne Keynes as well, and also the radio telescope, uh, which also sits in Milne Keynes. So these are all on campus. The instruments actually have, now they're located to where the old BBC studios were in Milne Keynes. So it's kind of a nice, uh, a nice idea. So all I have to do now is do uh, this. Ah, there we go. So I might just move that up the screen slightly. So this is actually... Um, if I just, I'm just going to renew this. This is actually the telescope view. So this is a typical interface of what students will see. Um, we can design the interface effectively. Uh, top left-hand corner, or top, yeah, top left-hand corner is actually a live webcam of the, the in this case, it's a radio telescope uh, that sat in the car park around the back of the library in Milton Keynes. Immediately next to this is going to build uh, building a Mars rover site. So this program is designed initially to be rolled out for a master's in space sciences, and it's to train the next generation of scientists to do with remote communications. So they'll learn how to program satellites, how to, to communicate with remote, remote instruments, and there are various uh, series of remote instruments. So this is a radio telescope, and um, for example, in this case, I'm just going to uh, press a button to do what they call a quick scan, and this, if... It's not, there you go, always, it's always the case. Technology always lets you down. And what I might just do is hit the refresh button. Because it's probably gone to sleep since I, I, uh, I loaded this up, up earlier. Okay, let's give it a try again. Okay, it's off. So actually what you're going to see here is a scan. Uh, are there any astronomers who understand radio telescopes in the audience? Hopefully not, so I can say whatever you want and you won't answer. Um, what you're effectively, what, the, what if you point this in the right place, it gives you some interesting stuff. I have no idea where to point it to get the interesting stuff. Uh, it's it's effectively measuring uh, the frequency of hydrogen at uh, 2.4 gigahertz, and you can interpret the peak. That doesn't mean uh, anything to me, and in fact, it do, wouldn't mean anything to an astronomer either, uh, because it's 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 pointing in the wrong place. This one hopefully is a little bit more interesting. I'm just going to learn my lesson and refresh, just be on the safe side. This is actually going to be a world first. Uh, hopefully you can see this. So this is actually um, sat in our uh, campus labs at Milton Keynes. It's a Biorad uh, CFX96. We have two qPCR machines. This is going to be used by my students to do some genetics experiments where we preload and we run them through a series of tutorials and then we can set off various experiments. So we're delivering live data for them. Uh, at the moment, what I can uh, make it do, for example, is so th this is hopefully live. I can, for example, close the lid, and off it goes, and it worked. Woohoo! That's the world first. There you go. That's a, I can also, at the moment, get. I can. I can actually check the electronics are working okay, and ask the machine, "Are you actually still there?" And it's going to blink at me to tell me it is, and hopefully that's blinking. Yes. So I'm actually talking to it now, and in this case, it's a very simple protocol, which I'm not going to follow through because it's a PCR protocol, and we'll be here forever. Effectively, once I start this running. The system will run, and uh, at the moment it, it, won't, it won't show you the data window, but it will open up a data window. You'd see real-time delivery of, of data. 
So, so that, that's uh, uh, the types of things that are going on uh, in those times. So this is the third instrument. Again, I'm going to learn my lesson and just refresh this page to be on the safe side. Um, again, I'll ask the question, any physicists in the audience who understand crystallography and X-ray scattering? Okay, so you, you might recognize the Bragg, Bragg experiment. Um, this is, uh, so this is an X-ray uh, an X-ray scattering experiment. If I just go to full screen, you might be able to see that a bit better. Okay, so again, you get used to the window. Top left is the real instrument sat in the old Perry building, the studios in uh, Walton Hall. It's effectively an X-ray tube, uh, tube, and what's sat next to it is a crystal. And what's going to happen is a crystal will rotate, and as it rotates, the X-rays will reflect upon layers in the crystal, and depending upon uh, the diffraction you get, you can interpret the data to tell you the size, uh, the distance between the layers. It's effectively the same principle that was used um, but it, to interpret uh, the famous uh, pictures of X-ray crystallography of stacked bases that Rosalind Franklin generated, that Crick and Watson recognized in terms of the, the, the layers of bases where the X-rays are diffracting off the different layers. So I actually ran this one earlier. This is a good scientific technique. I actually switched the machine down to 1.5 kilovolts, so very, very low. So this is my background. I'll point out that if you look on the scale on the left-hand side, you've got a unit of two, so that's a good, good bit of science here. So I'm now going to switch this up to full power, crank it up. We're going to now run it at, no we're not, yeah there we go, 35 kilovolts. And we're going to set it off and hopefully it will run. Okay, so if you keep a very close eye on the top left hand corner, it's first of all telling us it's safe. That's actually a Geiger counter you're looking at. And what you'll see is as the, the x-ray tube comes on, that's giving you the counts per minute that are now flicking out through the, the, through the x-ray tube. Um, it's all, it's all uh, held in, a, in obviously a nice safe box. So this is actually now plotting real data as it's been generated. So this crystal is actually re rotating through these angles on the bottom. So it's just about coming up to about seven degrees. And I know from experience that when you hit seven degrees, this is uh, the angle at which this crystal, the two lattices in the crystal, most reflect the incoming x-rays. And you can interpret that data and it will tell you the gap between the two layers of the crystal. So this is basic X-ray crystallography. This experiment uh, was, a, was essentially what uh, uh, Bragg got the Nobel Prize for in 1915. It's still used to this day. And of course, Bragg was based at the Cavendish Labs in, in Cambridge, where uh, in 1953, Crick and Watson effectively interpreted uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin's data to, to give what we think, what we now know of as a crystal structure or a structure of, of genetic DNA. So that's good. I'm really glad it actually worked and it ran, it ran really, really well. Um, so what this um, allows you to do, I've obviously gone in, a, I know exactly the right conditions to get the right answer out. I should say this is actually a crystal of, um, of sodium chloride. That's a very simple crystal. Um, but uh, I knew exactly the conditions. So what a student would do, um, as a simple demonstration, I can ask them to go and collect data at a particular set of conditions. But of course, that's really not what experiments are about. You should go in there and actually have the student find out what's the best angle. They can choose whatever angle they want. They can choose what power. What, so you can actually have a play with real instrumentation. So this is, this is what the OU, this is what we're going to be developing. I'm just going to switch back to my PowerPoint slides, hopefully. Yes, we're back on. And Last but not least, I said we were coming back to broadcasting. Um, the other thing uh, this lab has, has provided us with is um, a facility to do uh, live webcasting. So actually, we're going back to broadcasting. Uh, starting from this October, we'll actually be live casting to our students. And the reason for doing this is precisely for everybody who sat and watched Peter doing his cooking experiments, doing it live, watching it go wrong, watching that interactivity between an experiment and a presenter is actually what makes doing science fun and engaging. So actually we're using this. This is me actually just doing a, a rehearsal for a, a thing that's going out in October to our students, simply demonstrating the principle of fluorescence. They're going to actually look at some fluorescence of a Fitzy dye on, in a UV light, and I'm explaining the sounds of, I'm explaining, and we put the UV on and it, the tube on the left will, uh, will, will glow. They're using Fitzy as a, as a tracker in some microscopy experiments. And then they're going to go back and measure the emission of Fitzy 
and various properties of it using a PCR tracker because they're going to do qPCR with probes that are fixly labelled. So we're using this lab casting suite. It's a full laboratory with full uh, camera operability in it. And um, we're allowed, we can switch between different modes of presentation. So I'm explaining here the use of uh, the different label antibodies, in this case the FITSI or the, uh, the, the yellow dots. And you can see we've got cameras mounted in, around. I'm actually going to demonstrate the actual instrument itself and run through. And we can zoom in and see real data being collected. And there is always that experiment, experimental worry that it won't work, something will go wrong. So it, it is quite edgy. This is the technology we're going to use to actually set off live experiments. So my genetics experiment will kick off and we'll set off the qPCR. And then students will drop in uh, when they've got time to actually collect the data and, and then interpret it, uh, interpret it as they will. Um, what we have over the old TV days is a system of what we call live interactive quizzes. This gets pushed out in, uh, on the internet through a special live stream server. We have a series of interactive quizzes where we can actually ask students questions and get the answers back. It takes about 90 seconds, a 90 second delay between what's captured and streamed and what comes back. So we can actually ask questions. I'm going to do this experiment. What do you think is going to happen? And actually quiz students. So I did this uh, the other day on my colleagues. And it was a very simple experiment where I was asking them, if I put more of a particular compound in, will the absorbance go up or down? And much to my surprise, uh, not that many got it right, which is, is quite disappointing. This was just try, trying out the system. So actually, this live interactivity means that you can actually challenge students to, to interact directly. So it goes one beyond TV. It's live, but actually it's interactive, which is, uh, which is an incredibly powerful teaching tool. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I'm glad the remote experiment worked. Um, these are my contact details. Um, you can follow the Open Science Lab on Twitter on the left. Um, I'll leave those up uh, for you to get uh, details. ITunes, you should be able to find iTunes U and YouTube, and OpenLearn is very obvious. And if you are interested in the Open Science Lab, those are the details, and that lists the different types of things that are available. On the top, there's a little website, which is openscience.ac.uk. And in there, there's also a downloadable catalog, so you can actually print it offline and look at it if you're in a court. Thank you how, very much. How cool was that?